Ancient Egypt has always been regarded an enigma. It's partly because it was one of the oldest civilizations in the world and partly because very few documents and records from the era have survived to the present day. It's a land of mysteries. No other civilization has so captured the imagination of scholars and lay people alike. Mystery surrounds its origins, its religion and its monumental architecture, advanced technology, colossal temples, pyramids and the enormous sphinx. The Egyptian pyramids are the most famous of all the ancient monuments, but these are just one of hundreds of unsolved puzzles that cannot be fully explained. Despite all efforts to bury some of the discoveries in this documentary, more and more information is starting to leak out. There were so many things that these historians hoped we would not discover. Let's look at some of these mysteries. Twenty-five granite boxes Saqqara The ancient Egyptians ruled the world for close to 3,000 years after their legacy ended they left behind countless art Architecture and mythology that continues to captivate humankind Ancient Egypt also left behind mysteries that even the smartest scholars can't quite figure out from the Grand Pyramid of Giza to the mind-boggling hieroglyphics here is yet another enduring mystery added to that list strange black boxes each weighing more than a hundred tons were discovered buried in a hillside cave system located 12 miles south of the Great Pyramid of Giza interestingly most of these boxes are made of rose granite an extremely hard rock mined at a quarry located about 800 kilometers from Saqqara while other boxes were made from an even harder material diorite found even further away from Saqqara the manner in which they were created was so way ahead of their time some researchers have suggested that it was created by a different race altogether in total 24 black boxes were recovered from the site how did the ancient Egyptian manage to construct and position these boxes and why were they created in the first place archaeologists are still baffled by the boxes and their real purpose it's evident that these items were of great importance due to the intricateness of their designs and the fact that they were made to stay airtight for centuries these black boxes were discovered in the abandoned city of Memphis Egypt also known as the Serapium of Saqqara it was believed to have been built by Ramses II the third Pharaoh of the 19th dynasty of Egypt according to researchers this was also the same area where the Apis bulls were buried the Apis bulls were sacred bulls that the ancient Egyptians regarded as incarnations of the god Ptah. An Egyptologist suggests that because the bulls were treated as gods, one of Ramses II's sons could have ordered to have a tunnel excavated through one of the mountains in the large complex. He would later request that they design it with side chambers to contain the giant sarcophagi weighing up to 100 tons each of which served the purpose of holding the mummified remains of the bulls. In 1850, August Marriott's excavation of the Serapium of Saqqara first revealed the tombs of more than 60 bulls. The tombs were thought to have ranged from the time of Amenhotep III to the Ptolemaic dynasty. Interestingly enough, Marriott never sought out to make this amazing discovery, as his trip to Egypt was simply arranged to collect Coptic manuscripts. When that arrangement failed due to his inexperience, Marriott came across a Bedouin tribe who led him to Saqqara. The team used explosives to clear the rocks blocking the entrance to the catacombs and excavated most of the complex. Brian Forrester argues that the precision of construction of the surfaces of stone boxes, which are 100 tons with 30 ton lids, and the angles are within a few ten thousandths of an inch. The only question that remains is how and from where did the ancient Egyptians have the technology to build with such precision? Where are the tools used in these constructions? And why are these giant boxes empty? Advanced Stonework In 1881, British archaeologist Flinders Petrie found something remarkable near the Great Pyramids at Giza. 
he didn't unearth great riches or open an undisturbed tomb Petri picked up a piece of granite a 4,000 year old chunk of construction debris a treasure politely tucked away in the Petri Museum of Egyptology in London England one that defies explanation logic or reason Flinders Petri's chunk of granite core number seven only makes sense if you accept the ancient world as capable beyond imagination granite is hard it can only be cut with something harder today we use diamond tip drills murals show Egyptian workers cutting blocks of lime or sandstone with copper saws this makes sense on a scale of 1 to 10 1 being the softest copper is a 3 so are marble lime and sandstone granite is a 7 diamonds are 10 science doesn't know how but they think they know where number 7 came from a plug of red granite drilled to form a door pivot not chiseled drilled with precision accuracy drills leave marks behind a roadmap of rate and pressure this is when 4,000 year old granite cores get freaky the markings on core number seven are so perfectly spaced engineers don't believe a modern diamond tip mechanized drill could duplicate them over the years both Christopher Dunn and Stephen Meller undertook many trips to Egypt together and separately to pursue this and other lines of research they both continue to find numerous examples of artifacts and material such as granite diorite basalt alabaster as well as in limestone that appear to be machined and or produced by some advanced technique that cannot be explained as being produced by the toolkits found and presented to us by Egyptologists namely copper chisels and tube drills dolerite stone pounders and hammers Dunn reported in his book and continues to find examples of multiple contoured angles perfectly square corners and smoothly polished surfaces and tolerances of one ten thousandth of an inch in the hardest stones known today to drill granite we're using hydraulics pressured diamond tip machines this is the first anomaly Egyptologists claim that ancient Egyptians cut granite using copper saws water and sand fine cutting granite separating a stone block into two pieces we do not doubt this it's doable but to reach the level of precision found in Abyssur manual work is not enough not enough in terms of pressure and regularity in order to cut granite today we try to reach a pressure on the drilling head of 18 to 30 pounds per square inch which is 226 to 380 pounds of pressure for a four inch diameter drill hole how can you apply such pressure by hand with a mobile tool in order for it to actually perform the drilling it seems unlikely that dynastic Egyptians are the ones behind the most advanced accomplishments found in Abu Sir we're once again facing the likeliness of a pre flood highly advanced civilization a pre flood highly advanced civilization that occupied the land of Osiris before disappearing leaving behind the remains of ancient high technology that got erased as millennia passed by Khufu ship among the many dazzling discoveries made in Egypt is the famous boat Khufu ship the Khufu ship is an intact full-size vessel from ancient Egypt that was sealed into a pit in the Giza pyramid complex at the foot of the Great Pyramid of Giza around 2500 BC the ship was almost certainly built for Khufu the second Pharaoh of the fourth dynasty of the old kingdom of Egypt it's one of the oldest largest and best preserved vessels from antiquity it measures 143 feet long and 19 and a half feet wide it was thus identified as the world's oldest intact ship and has been described as a masterpiece of woodcraft that could sail today if put in water this type of boat is known as a solar barge a ritual vessel to carry the resurrected king with the Sun God Ra across the heavens however it bears some signs of having been used in water and it's possible that the ship was either a funerary barge used to carry the king's embalmed body from Memphis to Giza 
or even that Khufu himself used it as a pilgrimage ship to visit holy places and that it was then buried for him to use in the afterlife. The ship was rediscovered in 1954 by Kamal El Malak, undisturbed since it was sealed into a pit carved out of the Giza bedrock. It was built largely of Lebanon cedar planking in the shell first construction technique. It was originally dismantled into 1,224 individual parts. On top of the wood was a layer of mats and ropes, an instrument made of flint and some small pieces of white plaster. The prow of the boat, a wooden column topped by a round wooden disc was found at the western end of the pit. This column was connected to two long wooden pieces that extended along the bottom of the pit. Most of the wooden parts had been tied together with ropes. Also found inside the pit were many other items such as 12 oars, each made from a single piece of wood, 58 poles, 3 cylindrical columns and 5 doors. In total there were 13 layers of materials consisting of 651 artifacts. You can imagine the difficulty of reassembly of this many pieces with no idea how the finished boat should look. It took years for the boat to be painstakingly reassembled, primarily by the Egyptian Department of Antiquities chief restorer Ahmed Youssef Mustafa. Before reconstructing the boat, he had to acquire expertise on ancient Egyptian boat building. He studied the reliefs carved on walls and tombs and many of little wooden models of ships and boats found in tombs. He eventually completed the restoration. It's now on display in the museum on the south side of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Full-size ships and boats have been found buried at several locations close to ancient Egyptians, temples and pyramids. However, the precise function and the full story behind these ships, like many other things about ancient Egypt, will never be fully understood by our civilization. After all, that's why ancient Egypt is often called the greatest riddle of all. The unfinished obelisk was discovered in 1922 by Egyptologist Rex Engelbach. It remains attached to the bedrock by its underside. The project was abandoned when a large fissure was discovered during the process of being hewn from the rock. Chris Dunn wrote a book titled Advanced Technology in Ancient Egypt, wherein he suggests that the crack associated with the obelisk is more likely a product of a later wear and tear on the block. Another explanation that Dunn puts forward is to do with the highly superstitious beliefs of the ancient Egyptians who associated supernatural powers to large monoliths. He expounds that another possibility that might have contributed toward the abandonment of the obelisk could be that the stone was thought to have a supernatural aura that spared it from further cutting and deployment in a palace. The obelisk is situated just north of Aswan. It was constructed by Queen Hatshepsut who ruled Egypt during the 18th dynasty. She also constructed the temple in Deir el-Bahari on the west bank of Thebes. Just what are obelisks? These four-sided, tapered monuments were called Tekenu by the ancient Egyptians, but we now know them as obelisks, taken from the Greek word abaliskos. Typically placed at the entrance of temples, they are the hallmark of ancient Egyptian ingenuity and engineering. So beloved by successive civilizations, more than half of the remaining ancient obelisks reside outside Egypt, having been especially prized by the Romans. In fact, 13 are located in Italy. It's the largest known obelisk in the ancient Egypt. If it was completed, it would be about 42 meters high and weigh almost 1,200 tons. From there, do not know anything more. The study of these giant monuments has so far raised more questions than answers. The first problem is the stonework. It seems inexplicable to think this hard granite stone obelisk was made with copper tools. On the other hand, we find perhaps the most puzzling problem. How did the Egyptians move thousands of tons of stone? 
without breaking the fragile structure of the obelisks. How did the Egyptians manually load what today we cannot do with our best machines? There's a theory that it's been transferred dragging it to the river where it was shipped on a big boat made of papyrus and wood. The possible answer can be found in some of the reliefs of the temple of Queen Hatshepsut built in the cliff of Deir al-Bahari. Here we can see some reliefs showing ships moving obelisks on the Nile River. But more than an answer to our question, the relief seems to offer a major surprise as the ship carries two obelisks at once. What kind of boat could carry more than 2,000 tons on a river? If we add that the Nile is full of shoals where often modern ships are caught, it seems inexplicable how the Egyptians could transport these large obelisks hundreds of kilometers downstream. It's certain that the Egyptian obelisks offer a series of mysteries that experts have failed to resolve. In 1993, Rudolf Gattenbrink from Germany used a miniature robot with a camera to explore the air shafts leading out of the King's and Queen's chamber. The air shafts from the King's chamber were found to exit to the outside of the pyramid, where the Queen chamber's air shafts lead to had not been found. Using this robot, Gattenbrink positioned the small robot in the small air shaft of the southern end of the Queen's chamber and moved it up the air shaft. As the robot proceeded deeper and deeper into the air shaft, it finally came to the end of its journey. It had traveled about 200 feet into the shaft. It had made an amazing discovery. It did not lead to the outside. The camera was being monitored in the Queen's chambers by Gattenbrink. This is what he saw. There at the end of the shaft, he was looking at a small door complete with copper handles. He also noticed that there was a little gap under the door. It was too small for the robot to go under or for the camera to look under. This was an incredible discovery to say the least. Was a hidden chamber in the Great Pyramid of Giza finally found? Since the 1800s, several very interesting items have been found in the Great Pyramid of Giza. In 1836, Colonel Weiss discovered and removed a flat iron plate about 12 inches by 4 inches and an eighth of an inch thick from a joint in the masonry at the point where the southern air shaft from the King's Chamber exits the pyramid. Engineers agree that this plate was left in the joint during the building of the pyramid and could not have been inserted afterwards. What happened to this plate and has it been tested? Colonel Weiss sent the plate to the British Museum. The plate was examined by the famous Sir Flinders Petrie in 1881. He felt it was genuine and stated, no reasonable doubt can therefore exist about its being a really genuine piece. In 1989, it was subjected to scientific analysis. The tests were done by Dr. Jones at Imperial College and Dr. L. Geyer at the Suez University. They utilized both chemicals and optical tests. One hypothesis was that the metal may have come from a meteorite. How do we know if the iron is from a meteorite or man-made? We can determine this from the iron's nickel content. Meteorite iron has a higher value than the iron found on Earth. The analysis of the meteor plate yielded the following. The iron plate from Giza is clearly not of meteoric origin, since it contains only a trace of nickel. Further analysis revealed that it had traces of gold on its surface, maybe once gold-plated. Dr. Jones and Geyer concluded the following. It's concluded, based on the present investigation, that the iron plate is very ancient. Furthermore, the metallurgical evidence supports the archaeological evidence which suggests that the plate was incorporated within the pyramid at the time the structure was being built. The finding of this iron plate may cause us to change the date of the Iron Age by 2,000 years. Over the years, Howard Carter became convinced that there was at least one undiscovered tomb in Egypt, that of the almost unknown King Tutankhamun. For five years, Carter dug looking for the missing pharaoh and found nothing. His backer, Lord Carnarvon, summoned Carter to England in 1922 to tell him he was calling off the search. Carter managed to talk the Lord into supporting him for one more season of digging. 
Returning to Egypt, the archaeologist brought with him a yellow canary. A golden bird, Carter's foreman, Reese Ahmed, exclaimed. It will lead us to the tomb. Perhaps it did. On November 4, 1922, Carter's workmen discovered a step cut into the rock that had been hidden by debris left over from the building of the tomb of Ramses IV. Digging further, they found 15 more leading to an ancient doorway that appeared to still be sealed. On the doorway was the name Tutankhamun. It's said that when Carter arrived home that night, his servant met him at the door. In his hand, he clutched a few yellow feathers. His eyes large with fear, he reported that the canary had been killed by a cobra. Carter, a practical man, told the servant to make sure the snake was out of the house. The man grabbed Carter by the sleeve. The pharaoh's serpent ate the bird because it led us to the hidden tomb. You must not disturb the tomb. Scoffing at such superstitious nonsense, Carter sent the man home. Carter immediately sent a telegram to Carnivon in England and waited anxiously for his arrival. Though under close inspection, it appeared that the outer sections of the tomb had been entered in ancient times, the door to the innermost part of the tomb still seemed to be intact. Carnivon made it to Egypt by November 26th and watched as Carter made a hole in the door. Carter leaned in, holding a candle to look. Behind him, Lord Carnivon asked, Can you see anything? Carter answered, Yes, wonderful things. Nobody seemed to be concerned about any curse. Rumors later circulated that Carter had found a tablet with the curse inscribed on it, but hid it immediately so it would not alarm his workers. Carter denied doing so. The tomb was intact and contained an amazing collection of treasures, including a stone sarcophagus. The sarcophagus contained three gold coffins nested within each other. Inside the final one was the mummy of the boy king, Pharaoh Tutankhamun. A few months after the tomb's opening, tragedy struck. Lord Carnivon, aged 50, was taken ill and rushed to Cairo. He died a few days later. The exact cause of his death was not known, but it seemed to be from an infection started by an insect bite. Even more strange, when the mummy of Tutankhamun was unwrapped in 1925, it supposedly was found to have a wound on the left cheek in the same exact position as the insect bite on Carnivon that led to his death. By 1929, 11 people connected with the discovery of the tomb had died early and of unnatural causes. Now we focus on an attempt to hide evidence of unknown civilization that may have left us with great wonders both above and below the sands of the Giza Plateau. The idea of there being a secret chamber buried somewhere beneath the Sphinx was first popularized by renowned psychic Edgar Cayce in 1932. Cayce believed that this secret chamber contained an ancient hall of records which contained, among other things, manuscripts detailing the history of mankind much further back than we're currently aware, possibly even back to the world before the flood. He also predicted that the hall would be discovered sometime around the year 2000. This prophecy may have come true. Many years ago, scientists using an array of techniques searching on and around the Sphinx discovered one or more large box-shaped hollow areas just below the Sphinx. One of these enclosures is located beneath the paws of the Sphinx, just where Casey had predicted the Hall of Records would be found. Why have these chambers not yet been opened? What could be within them? Florida State University, on behalf of the SCORE expedition, carried out a remote sensing survey around the Sphinx and elsewhere on the plateau for three weeks in April of 1996. They claimed to have found rooms and tunnels in front of the Sphinx and running from the rear of the Sphinx. Several other projects have made similar claims. In 1987, a Japanese team from Waseda University, under the direction of Sakuji Yoshimura, 
carried out an electromagnetic sound survey of the Khufu Pyramid and Sphinx. They reported evidence of a tunnel oriented north-south under the Sphinx, a water pocket 2.5 to 3 meters below surface near the south hind paw and another cavity near the north hind paw. In 1991, a team consisting of geologist Robert Schock, Thomas DeBecky and John Anthony West carried out a survey of the Sphinx using seismic refraction, refraction tomography and seismic reflection. The investigators interpreted their data to indicate shallower subsurface weathering patterns toward the back and deeper weathering toward the front, which they take to indicate that the back of the Sphinx and its ditch were carved by Khafra later than the front. They interpret their data to likewise indicate subsurface cavities in front of the front left paw and from the left paw back along the south flank. The Egyptian Antiquities Department issued a statement, we cannot give permission to dig into the natural rock of the Sphinx or to drill into the Sphinx on the basis of anomalies, especially now that our highest priority is to conserve the Sphinx. Remote sensing programs should anyway be carried out elsewhere to test the techniques and to demonstrate that it works before it's used to make sensational claims of secret rooms in the Sphinx. Lastly, another interesting fact about the Sphinx is the pattern of erosion. It indicates that it was carved at the end of the last ice age when heavy rains fell in the eastern Sahara, perhaps more than 12,000 years ago. This contrasts starkly with the orthodox Egyptological data for the Sphinx being about 4,500 years old. Something is being covered up. Abu Simbel Well, the pyramids of Giza are perhaps the most recognizable artifacts of the ancient Egyptian world. Following closely behind are the Abu Simbel temples in southern Egypt. In 1813, Johann Ludwig Burckhardt, the first explorer to rediscover the lost temple, stumbled upon the heads of some massive statues. He deemed them more beautiful than any ancient Egyptian figure he had yet seen. These statues alone were enough to capture the world's attention, but when the temple itself was excavated, the full extent of his discovery was probably even beyond his wildest imagination. It took four years for workers to clear enough sand to uncover the temple entrance. Another two years of excavation passed until the four seated, 10 meter statues of Ramses II were fully revealed. When archaeologists and artists could finally enter, their etchings and notes captivated people everywhere. Egypt mania swept the world. The temples are located on the west bank of the Nile River approximately 230 kilometers southwest of Aswan in an area known as Nubia. Work on the Abu Simbel temples, which were to be carved out of the mountainside, started in 1264 BCE, during the reign of King Ramses the Great. While the exact completion date isn't known, archaeologists are relatively certain that they'd been completed by 1244 BCE. Like all temples, the Abu Simbel temples were built for worship but most historians believe they were also designed to impress Egypt's neighbors and to further emphasize the importance of traditional Egyptian religion. Ironically, by the 6th century BCE, the majestic temples had been abandoned and they had already become partially buried under the desert sands. Slowly but surely, they vanished from sight, only to be discovered more than 2,000 years later in 1813 when the top frieze of the main temple was spotted sticking out of the sand. After a failed first attempt to enter the ancient temples, J. L. Burkhart returned to the site for a second time in 1817 and he successfully entered them. Unfortunately, as has happened often in Egypt's long history, he took everything that he could carry with him, essentially looting the temples. During the 1960s, the Abu Simbel Temple was threatened by the construction of the Aswan High Dam. It was decided that the monument should be saved and proposals on how this should be done were accepted. In the end, it was decided that the temple be dismantled and then reassembled at a new location. This undertaking, which began in 1964, was completed in 1968 and is considered by many to be one of the greatest feats of archaeological engineering. 
According to one source, the Abu Simbel Temple is the most visited site in Egypt after the Pyramids of Giza. The temples of Abu Simbel are now located on a man-made hill in Lake Nasser. While the Pharaoh's temple was larger than that of his wife's, statues of Ramses II and Nefertiti are of equal size. Historians believe this shows just how much he loved and respected his wife. This is something which is unique to Pharaoh Ramses II. The Temple of Seti I at Abydos has a hieroglyphic panel that bears symbols resembling the helicopter, spaceship, and fighter jet planes. The writings have become known as the helicopter hieroglyphs, with many supporters of the theory saying if the ancient civilization was putting helicopters and modern spacecraft in their artwork, then they must have seen them, or at least pictures of them. Could it be that extraterrestrials visited our planet all those centuries ago and that the ancient Egyptians tried to depict their spacecrafts in the best way they knew how? Another work of hieroglyphic art depicts a flying object that's emitting some rays pointed toward an animal. This hieroglyph is said by some to be concrete evidence that not only aliens exist, but they also have been abducting animals and humans since the ancient times. For now, it's difficult to prove such a theory, but at the very least, this is a possibility that must be considered. These hieroglyphs have, of course, sparked furious debate over the years. This is an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph of the house altar depicting Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and three of their daughters in limestone from the New Kingdom Amarna period, 18th dynasty, circa 1340 BCE, is currently housed in the News Museum in Berlin. Note both Nefertiti and Akhenaten are seen sitting with three strange looking beings. Human features can easily be made out in other hieroglyphs, hence, some researchers take this to be obvious evidence of aliens in ancient Egypt. Remember, Akhenaten is considered to be one of the most mysterious pharaohs of ancient Egypt. His religious actions, taken during his life, pushed Egyptologists to call him the alien pharaoh. It's interesting to know that until the fifth year of his reign, he was known as Amenhotep IV, ruling over Egypt for 17 years. A flying saucer are seen in some of the hieroglyph panels that are found on the walls of ancient Egyptian monuments. The shape and structure of some of the alleged flying saucer are so accurate that someone might think that the ancient Egyptians had referred to a sci-fi movie to draw that. A papyrus discovered in 1933 that could give us an exact connection between UFOs and Egyptian civilization. Alberto Tulli oversaw copying the writings he found in an antique shop during a visit to Cairo in the 1930s. Tulli mentioned the papyrus was too expensive for him, so he decided to copy them only to translate them. The writings related how some of the king's guards witnessed a strange object that rushed over their land and from which the creatures with a wingspan they'd never seen before came out. Bodies up to 45 meters long, with a different language. They warned Pharaoh and he ordered an investigation, but when they returned, the number of apparitions in heaven had multiplied. Egyptian gold jewelry was found in the tomb of Queen Zer and Queen Puabi of Ur in Samaria and are the oldest examples found jewelry from the 3rd millennium BC. Over the centuries, most Egyptian tombs were robbed, with the artifacts ending up in a private collection. Among them was puzzling medallions, which is shown that looks like an extraterrestrial, fueling speculation that the Egyptians had contact from an alien civilization. Today, archaeologists are still making important discoveries, shedding new light on the ancient Egyptians. The ongoing deciphering of the hieroglyphic writings and research on ancient technology are also answering many questions related to the evolution of Egyptian culture. Without the Egyptians, we would not be the people we are today. The amount of knowledge that's been provided from ancient Egyptian times has shaped our modern day world inside and out. Hopefully, we will one day be able to fully explain this most mysterious civilization.